Chapter 9, Transforming the Economy, 1800 to 1860. So we're still in that antebellum era, the pre-Civil War era. And we're talking about the 19th century American economy. And, and two items are developing in America still in its early years. Number one is a major increase in production due to the Industrial Revolution. We'll talk about what that is here in a minute. Number two, the expansion of commerce and what's called the market revolution. So what is the market revolution? According to your book, the dramatic increase between 1820 and 1850 in the exchange of goods and services and market transactions. So I, I would say 1800 to 1860 would be would be fine too, but <clears throat> the, the point is it's it's in this antebellum era, okay, that this this country's exploding with with business. So the market revolution reflected the increased output of farms, but now factories also. <clears throat> And is the result of the entrepreneurial activities of traders and merchants. And you have a creation of a transportation network of roads, canals, and railroads. We talked about how difficult travel had been getting across the Appalachian Mountains. Well, in this era, because of the Industrial Revolution and mechanization, we, we, you solve these problems. So the transportation revolution will be a, a subject of a supplemental lecture that we'll do later in this chapter. <clears throat> So what is this industrial revolution? What, what does that mean exactly, industrial revolution? It's going on around the world. Um, again, from your book, a burst of major inventions and economic expansion based on water and steam power and the use of machine technology that transformed certain industries such as cotton, textiles, iron, and railroads between 1790 and 1860. So so expansion based on power, water and steam power, machine technology, you didn't have machines before. And this transforms industries. Uh, lab much labor became mechanized. So mechanization, mechanized was, was a word that you hadn't heard before. And leads, uh, led to the rise of a, of a, a job called a mechanic. You, you hadn't had that before. What's a mechanic? A skilled craftsman who invented and improved tools for industry and we talked about the cotton gin a perfect example of of a machine coming out of this era <clears throat> that improved the industry uh, in, unless you were a slave of course <clears throat> but eli whitney invented the cotton gins we know he also invented interchangeable parts uh, this this uh, led to a, a a huge rise in manufacturing and drop in prices why if you were in the business of manufacturing military weapons and this idea that if a, if a trigger broke on one of your rifles, you couldn't take it from another rifle because they're all different, because they're all handmade. Each one's custom handmade. Uh, but now you've got machines that make these parts all the same, <clears throat> exactly the same. You can now take a trigger from another uh, another rifle and put it in your rifle and it would fit. Of course, this, this creates a whole new industry of part stores. And our entire life is about park stores. We're constantly going to, you know, Home Depot if you're a homeowner or, or not. Uh, you know, you go to the grocery store. Many times you're buying things that will fit into or you'd be a, or a, re, a replacement part for something that you that you use. So uh, this, this, of course, you know, revolutionizes commerce. And because you can manufacture them so at such volume because of machines in factories, excuse me, they drop in value. I'm sorry, drop in price. They become cheaper. <clears throat> so all this results in an in, in era. Part of this era is known for its artisan republicanism. So again, not of the Republican Party, but of a republic. So this era celebrated small-scale producers, uh, people who own their own shops or farms. I, I should say men because women weren't owning their own shops or farms in these days. Uh, shops in the north, uh, farms in the south. And they felt equal to one another. It was all part of, uh, of being an American. You could, you know, you were free to work for yourselves. And, and you didn't have a, a feudal lord with their thumb on you. But because of the rise of factories, especially in the north, a, a person's life changed from waking up in the morning and going to work on a farm, on your farm or your family's farm, to now you, you travel to the factory, you punch a time clock and you go to work. And now you have a boss, and they expect you to work a certain amount of hours per, per day. They're going to pay you this amount of money. And this idea led to the rise in labor, organized labor. 
uh, and the idea of a labor movement began. Of course, this is a huge development and, and one that will continue to grow as American history progresses from this point. And of course, huge and powerful movement today, very influential in elections and politics, the e economy even today. It, it, uh, labor is a, a huge part of our lives. But in the early 19th century, the thought of workers' rights was new because you didn't have workers. You, you, you didn't have you know, people in one place working for one person. People were working on farms. Uh, so it led to the rise of unions. Of course, the factory owners weren't very happy about this. They, what, what do you, you, you shouldn't have any room to complain. I'm giving you a job. Work 12 hours a day, six days a week, maybe seven if I can get it. You should be happy. But no, we're, we're not happy. And so unions are, were developed to organize workers during the Industrial Revolution, to bargain with employers over wages, hours, benefits, and control of the workplace. And it was in response to low wages, long hours, time away from the family, lack of opportunities for education. An interesting labor system is one that was called the Waltham Lowell system, <clears throat> a system of labor using young women. So young women were, were recruited from farm families in New England, all over New England, to come to the factories in Lowell, Massachusetts, Chicopee, uh, to, to work. Uh, and this was, of course, done with the approval of, of her parents. So the, young, the young woman ha would have an adventure and, and go to the factories for a period of time and work there. All the money she made would be sent back to her family, so she wouldn't get any money, but they gave her room and board. She's taken care of and, and the family benefits, okay? Uh, they were expected to live in company boarding houses. They were under, you know, the factory's control at all times. Strict rules, curfews, uh, usually required to attend church. This truly is where the idea of paying women less begins. Why? Because they were still with their families, and it was seen as their father supported them financially. So they didn't need that much money because their father supported them. It justified paying them less. Of course, we can't imagine why would you pay somebody less just because they're they're married to a man or you know still living with their father. That doesn't make any sense. And if you think about it, the factory owner's pretty happy because he's getting labor. And he's getting it for less because the woman has a father. That doesn't make any sense. But that's the way that it was. You know, that, that was the way that the system worked. And women weren't seen as, you know, a, a, a viable force anyway. They're, they're just women. Okay. They're, they're, they're not going to, you know, bother or say anything. Uh, they should just be, ha be happy to be here. But interestingly about these girls uh, who, the, who the mill owners thought were naive and they would do anything that they would, were told to do, that wasn't what happens. They, they happened. They, they became angry about their meager pay, and they went on strike to complain. So good for them, huh? Uh, this is an absolute shock that these young women would do something so bold. So you didn't have to be a man to be bold and aggressive. It's the American way. It's new American character, regardless of gender. So the feeling amongst the working class in general was the idea that capital and labor stand opposed. And, and this starts the age-old conflict and argument that still goes on today. And as a downside to capitalism is the, the uh, ruling elite owners make all the money and the workers don't. The capitalist has no other interest in us than to get as much labor out of us as possible. We are hired men and hired men like hired horses have no souls. So it starts, again, part of the labor movement. We, we want more rights, we want a bigger piece of the pie, but we still, in our modern day, live in the era of, an era of the inequality of wealth. You know, the working class that does all the labor is not making very much money and living in, in some cases, you know, below the poverty line, while the owners of businesses are jet setting around the world. So is that fair? Um, another ideology that came out of this era is called the labor theory <clears throat> of value. And this is the idea that human labor produces economic value. And it argued that the price of a product should be, should be determined not by the market supply and demand, but by the amount of work required to 
make it. And then this is the key part. Most of the price should be paid to the person who produced it. Very interesting idea. Uh, and one that didn't take, this is, this is a kind of a socialist point of view here, and one that did not take in America, but I, but it was a thought at that time, and I'm sharing it with you to, to, to illustrate how the shift towards individual rights continues. Started with the revolution, now here you are with, with labor and all these workers, and it continues. We're going to continue to try to, you know, celebrate and, and support the worker, the common you know, a uh, person, not the ruling elite, okay? Okay, I mentioned that we were going to do a supplemental election, the transportation revolution, so let's do that right here. Number 10, okay? And uh, here's our outline. Number one, introduction. Travel had always been a problem. Number two, methods. National roads, steamboats, canals, railroads. So those are the four methods that were new that created this transportation revolution. So you're going to, you're going to be asked to you know, give details about all four. What's the result? It created inland centers of commerce, and some of them became hubs. And of course, the relevance. Okay, let's get started. So, dramatic changes in transportation networks and the construction of roads, canals, railroads, steamships on rivers and lakes led to the expansion of markets. Uh, because now people have the ability to move inland, and, and these transportation networks led to, led to uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, facilitated the movement of people as and goods, and it altered the physical landscape. Uh, first is the National Road. Uh, so we remember the Appalachian Mountains remained a barrier to a nationwide transportation structure. Remember how they used to pen the colonists to the East Coast because they couldn't get across those mountains. So, so roads through the mountain passes were an easy answer to the problem. And in 1802, uh, Congress authorized the construction of the paved national road. So paved is a key, key word because it's not just dirt. Part of the problem with roads was that they, they would get muddy and impassable when it rained. So now you're going to pave them. And it starts with cobblestones, later brick. It might be, you know, it might be uh, lumber, whatever it was to to not create a quagmire of mud, but also give the wagon wheels traction on something. Okay. So from Cumberland, Maryland here to Wheeling, West Virginia is the first leg. And that is across the mountains right there. But this road continues. It keeps going. It kept going and kept going. It goes all the way to the Pacific Ocean at some point. And today... Many parts of the National Road are part of the interstate highway system, so, so it's grown quite a bit. Of course, along, along the road, as you see here in the map, all these, all these new towns kind of spring up that had, that had not been seen before. So small towns began to grow and prosper inland and with an increase in population because now people had a reason to come. Uh, and and many, many evolved into... Business centers, uh, centers of business and industry. Um, this happened to many of these kind of small towns and villages along the road. They, as they kept on growing, they became big business centers. Uh, okay. Uh, so along the road, you'd have different businesses, taverns, blacksmith shops, livery stables, all popped up to, of course, aid the traveler. Uh, it's interesting that the most important and numerous business found on the National Road were taverns. There was a tavern situated about every mile on the road. So, you know, alcohol was a big a big deal in those days. It was part of everyday life, and you wanted to be able to stop and have a drink <clears throat> when you wanted to. So you can go, you could stop and get a drink every mile on the average on the on the National Road. Okay, next is, is steamboats. The eastern half of North America has many navigable bodies of water. You've got the Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio River systems. You got the Great Lakes. This this made for internal easy internal travel and shipping because you can travel along the waterways. <clears throat> so if you were a, a business person in Illinois, let's just say that you're in the lumber business and your your business is to cut down trees and then mill the trees into, you know, uh, lumber that's suitable for construction, 
Okay. Uh, when you get a <clears throat> when you get a load of lumber, you wanna you wanna ship, you know, out to the world, Europe especially. Um, what would you do? You would you would build a skiff or a flat boat or some kind of raft to put your lumber on and float down the, the Mississippi River all the way to New Orleans to sell your product. <clears throat> okay. And they did this year after year. So what what would happen? You'd get there, you'd sell your lumber to an exporter who would then take it across the Atlantic to, to sell it in Europe. Of course, your job's done, you got your money. But how do you get home? You floated down the river. The Mississippi River flows south. You can't go up because it's got a current and it's going to hold you back. You can't row a boat up upstream. It will take you forever to get back. So what do you do? You get a stagecoach, costs cost you money. You buy a horse, ride back, costs you money and time. Or you walk back. So what happens? Well, bandits knew that these men were doing this and they robbed them. So all that hard work, you lose your money. But now with the steamship, you can now float down, do your business, get rid of your flat boat or whatever it was, and bypass on a, on a steamship, passage on a steamship, and go upriver because a steamship has an engine that turns a big paddle wheel that can now go against the current and go upriver. Okay, completely revolutionized business with this idea because now you can, now you can travel upriver without being you know um, you know uh, held back by the current. Uh, so the, the steamship revolutionized, you know, uh, 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 travel and, and shipping tremendously. And it, and it led to uh, the construction of many canals, okay? Uh, the most important one for our purpose is the Erie Canal, where you're connecting Lake Erie, Buffalo, New York on the west, to Albany, New York on the east. So we go back to our colonial days. We know that Albany was the furthest north colonial settlement for the English, but Albany and New York City, of course, an important port even in those days, uh, is connected by the Hudson River. You can, you, can, you can sail from Albany to New York or go upriver. Uh, it's, it, it's the river is the whole way, but you want to be able to get goods over here, okay? And if we could figure out a way to do that, of course, people will come too. And then you're going to have these inland centers. So this idea of building a canal um, was begun. Uh, shipping goods west from Albany was time-consuming and costly. There wasn't any railroad yet. Uh, if you were to ship your goods by stagecoach from Buffalo to, from, from New York City to Buffalo, it would take two weeks, a long time, down time. Uh, and also, a stagecoach couldn't carry that much of your product. So if you were in the Again, the lumber business, you, 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 you're out of luck. Uh, so in 1817, Congress authorized the ex expenditure of $7 million. So that's not very much money today, but it, it was all it took back then for the construction of this canal. It would be 40 feet wide. So if you think about a typical college classroom, you know, a typical one, that's probably about 40 feet wide, uh, just to give you an idea. It would be 40 feet wide, as wide as the classroom, four feet deep. So you're going to dig this hole only four feet deep because you're going to have flat boats, not not any, you know, deep, you know, uh, uh, boats that, that are, uh, you know, like, like ocean ocean uh, bearing. But a flat boat has, has a very, you know, uh, kind of low indentation in the water. Okay, so you don't have to dig it 20 feet deep, four feet enough. Uh and then you're going to do this for 363 miles. So imagine, imagine the job that you have to do. Dig this hole four feet deep, 40 feet wide for 363 miles. Let's uh, watch our first film here. Please watch the film entitled The Erie Canal, kind of a background on, on the construction of this canal, and then come on back. Okay, so like I said on the on the national road with the taverns every mile. In this case, you've got you know rum every every you know distance, so the men could drink. It's because they men were expected to drink even when they're working in those days. Okay, so the Ear Canal opens October 26, 1825. It was Governor Dewitt Clinton, as the film showed you that that it was his idea. He proposed this canal from Buffalo, from the eastern point of Lake Erie to Albany you know, on the upper Hudson. 
And they did this by passing through the gap in the mountains in the Mohawk Valley region. So the Erie Canal opens to great fanfare. Uh, and it connects the Great Lakes with the Atlantic Ocean via the Hudson River. This is remarkable. You can now transport goods by water from, from the Great Lakes to New York City. Uh, the effect of the canal was immediate and dramatic. And if you watch the end of that film, you see how quickly the land transformed by what many would call progress. You know, uh, uh, commerce and business pops up and, and forests are cleared and, and cities pop up and roads and, and factories and, and it's all progress and, and, uh, you know, industry. Of course, Native Americans, not not around much anymore but still enough to see these things are just marveling at who these people are why why do you want to do that two different two very different people as we know okay uh <clears throat> okay so settlers not just goods but settlers now pour into western new york ohio michigan illinois wisconsin because you have a way to get there now that wasn't a covered wagon if you've ever watched the old the old movie How the West Was Won, uh, that's how that movie starts. The family comes west on the Erie Canal. Many did, uh, and it changed business completely. Goods were being transported at one tenth the previous fee in less than half the previous time. So, if you've never owned a business that I've mentioned before, I have. You know, you, you are very concerned and keen on what your bottom line is. What your bottom line is, your expenses. You know, how, how much am I spending to make the money I make? I mean, you want to always get that to be less and less and less. If you can cut your expenses, it means more money in your pocket. So just as a previous business owner, I can just give you a bit of advice here. If you own a business and you have a way to ship your goods at one-tenth the previous cost, and, and, and that could happen in less than half the time, you're going to be all over that, and, and you're going to be so happy because that's just that's putting big money in your pocket. So the Erie Canal transformed America, one that you don't hear about very often, but, but one of those key moments that truly changed the character of who America was and became, okay? Uh, okay, so no other man-made American water channel witnessed the transportation of goods that traveled the Erie Canal. Uh, and it's still it's still in existence. It's no longer a, a you know commerce uh, corridor, but uh, pleasure boats and you know people still travel across it. It's still there. Uh, so the answer to east west transportation, seemingly anyway, came not with roads, which many expected, but instead through the development of a system of canals. And uh, for for two decades, the United States went through a canal mania. They were building canals everywhere. State governments rushed to connect cities and regions with rivers and lakes. You want to get connected to, to waterways because you can transport goods that way. But the age of canals turned out to be short-lived uh, because many Americans realized that railroads could better accomplish their goal of connecting the east and the west than canals. So in 1830s, most railroads simply joined major waterways, as I mentioned before, to connect them to rivers and lakes and move goods. By 1860, the United States possessed 30,000 miles of rails right at the doorstep of the Civil War. Uh, most of the, of the railroads, however, were east of the Missouri River, and most were in the north. This would become a factor in the Civil War because the South didn't have as many railroads where the North did, and they could they could move troops and, and supplies much easier. So the, so the Civil War became one of the first wars uh, that transported troops and supplies by railroads, and, and railroads became a, a big part of the strategy and overall plan of a, of a war where in you know, back in the Revolutionary days, you, you, you faced your, your enemy face to face because you wanted to reduce the number of fighting men but in the civil war you wanted to take rail centers and you know conquer that town and take it over because if you if you take over the rail center and and you and the your enemy can't transport goods by railroad you're going to starve starve that person you don't even have to fight them 
so railroads, railroads became a huge part of the of the Civil War uh, strategy. Um, okay. Uh, by 1869, uh, a, a railroad, the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, we remember Thomas Jefferson very astutely said, "Look for a way for look look for a route for a transcontinental railroad." When he sent Lewis and Clark, here we are, sixty something five years later, and it comes to fruition. The transcontinental railroad is built, a huge accomplishment that finally linked the two coasts of America. So these these cities and towns in the interior be begin to emerge and they get bigger and bigger because of the expansion of industry and trade along with these very important new transportation corridors that you, that you couldn't have you know you, you couldn't have done it without without that so many new city many small villages and towns become big cities and in, in you know large centers uh, and many become what were what became known as hub so we, we, we know what a hub is that this is probably not the best example here but this is a, a the uh railroad system in the united states today <clears throat> and you see the chicago all roads lead to chicago that's the hub well like today if you're going to fly to new york city you might fly to atlanta first that's that's a hub for many airlines they fly everybody there then they send them out from there okay so many of these cities became hubs for certain industries uh depending on what your industry was. So a hub is a center around which everything else revolves. So these inland cities, Chicago, Detroit, Indianapolis, you know, became uh, relevant trade centers in their own right. It wasn't just the East Coast uh, cities along the coast anymore, okay? Okay, to end the lecture, the relevance, this is a little bit longer than usual, I'm sorry. Atlantic seaports that had been around since the beginning, such as Boston, Philadelphia, Charleston, New York City, remain important for international trade. But the system of the interior is how those goods would reach people throughout the country and led to the expansion of the interior lands. One more time. Relevance. The Atlantic seaports that had been around since the beginning, such as Boston, Philadelphia, Charleston, New York City remain important for international trade, but the system of the interiors, how those goods would reach people throughout the country and led to the expansion of the interior lands. <clears throat> okay. okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number 10, the transportation revolution, and let's keep going. So what about social classes in America, the, a, a place that was not supposed to be about that? It was supposed to be getting away from Europe, but from the very beginning, as we know, the, the social pyramid begins. This is a look at, at, at a, a pyramid of the, of the South in those days. Uh, so at the very top, you have the wealthy planters, <coughs> the plantation owners. Uh, below them, <clears throat> the artisan craftsman, the, the yeoman farmer, who, who may or may not own some slaves. Uh, below that is the poor whites, the impoverished whites. So I'm not talking about African Americans here because they're enslaved. The, 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 these are white people. Um, then you have the color line. <clears throat> so above the line, you're white. Below it, you're black. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. <clears throat> So before you get to the line of slavery, you've got free blacks, a very small portion of, of uh, the, the community that was African American that were free, but, but still not, not anywhere near, you know, uh, the opportunities of, of the white people. Uh, and of course, below that is slavery, uh, people enslaved. Um, so, so people were separated by their social station in life. Class became very important. People were judged and condemned for who they were or who they weren't, where they were from or where they came from, or why they weren't from a certain place. Uh, we're still the same today, right? I mean, we, we still do the same thing. So let's watch our next film here. Uh, this film takes place in present times, but it illustrates how we haven't changed that much. So today with social media, so you know, truly a, a remarkable achievement in communications where you know, we, we all take it for granted today, but I mean, my gosh, 20 years ago, you never would have realized, you know, texting and pictures and all the things that we do. You, you would have said, no way, that, that's impossible. So we, we tend to take it all for granted. 
uh, and we don't appreciate it for what it is. And it's kind of, in many ways, devolved into a place to bash people, bully people. So we think we've progressed as, as a people from the early 19th century, but perhaps in some cases we really haven't. So please go ahead and watch the film, A Nation of Tribes, How Social Class Divides Us. Okay, so back to our classes. The very top, you have the business elite, the, the very, very wealthy, the merchants, the manufacturers, the bankers, the landlords, and they're they're in the you know most expensive carriages of the day, and and they you got expensive wardrobes. But but below them, this is a def, a, you know a a result of the industrial revolution of the 19th century. You have the emergence of a middle class. This is an economic group of prosperous farmers, artisans, traders. They emerge in this in this era, and uh, their rise was a result from the, all this dramatic increase in prosperity, from a surge in income, from an abundance of mass-produced goods, and it created a distinct middle-class culture. So, former working-class men, poor men rise to the newly formed middle class. So how do you do that? I mean, maybe maybe you're promoted, maybe you've you've uh, the owner of the company is impressed by you, but they see you as ambitious and they and they and, and you rise above and you enter into the newly forming middle class. And in, in most cases you you're you're making enough money to save some money and you can buy a better home and better neighborhood. So it's not any different today. We all want to you know, move, move up the income ladder, okay, the, the, the socioeconomic ladder. But it led to a rise of a different type of work for men, white-collar workers, entrepreneurs, coming out of the emerging middle class. So what do I mean by white-collar? Well, if you're working class, you're talking about men in these days, you work with your hands, with tools. You got muddy and dirty and sweaty. That's the working class. Even today, you, you take your car to a mechanic, they typically have on blue collar shirts white collar means your fingernails are clean you're going to be using pens and pencils and you're going to be wearing a suit and, and you're you're um you're not going to be getting your hands there that's white collar uh you know it's a, it's a move up the income ladder uh <clears throat> and this resulted in a change of american society with this emerging middle class especially the upper middle class so Victorian middle-class homes became the domain of women. And women would entertain guests in the parlor. They would educate and raise their children. They would govern the family's social life. As we know, an extension of the cult of true domesticity, the Republican motherhood. Uh, <clears throat> they, be, they were often hard on the men of that era. You know, we're, we're, we, we are rising up here. We're bettering ourselves. Stop being so unsophisticated learn, learn learn some class uh stop telling lewd stories and being profane and spitting tobacco juice everywhere you got to rise up here okay uh <clears throat> so how how do these men come up this ladder again i mean like i said promotion maybe you caught the owner's eye but also the growth of labor unions move some blue collar workers up the income ladder to white collar middle class lifestyles so the middle class included a variety of different types of people, doctors, lawyers, clergymen, teachers, bankers, factory owners, shopkeepers, although probably they would be considered lower middle class. And this is all of what is part of what is called the Victorian America. So I mentioned that before. So what, what does Victorian mean? Like why do they call it the Victorian era? It refers to the era of Queen Victoria in England. And, and she would be, um, you know, her her reign of, of being the queen was 60-something years, 1837-1901. So most of the second half of the 19th century, she was the queen of England. And this is a time where the British Empire reached its height, a time of change. And maybe you're saying, well, now, wait a minute. Did we fight a revolution against them? What do we care what they're doing? Well, we're still inspired by them. They were, they were still like America's uh, older sister. Uh, England was still a very influential world power. So in England, like America, America tended to mirror whatever England was doing in those days. Industry and, tra and trade expanded rapidly there also. Science and technology made 
made great advances. Uh, the middle class grew enormously with an overall population from up to 50%. That's incredible. It, and also, like America, changed from an agricultural nation to a mainly industrial nation. So who was Queen Victoria and why was she so influential? Let's watch our next film. Please watch the film entitled The Era of Queen Victoria the First, and then come on back. <clears throat> so the Victorian era in England and in America, it, it was considered to be a period of refinement in England, peace, prosperity. And the people were moralistic, not profane. They, they pushed for political industrial reform. They practiced self-restraint and moral uplift. And this idea of the stuffy and proper English was born. Uh, people from England, especially men, gained a reputation as, of, of being very conservative and a stiff upper lip and stuffy. The point of even being uptight uh, and unable to cope with breaks from the way that they believe things should be. Uh, this is all part of being English and living in the Victorian era. Uh, but many of these behaviors found their way to 19th century America also. So America was greatly influenced by the Victorian era in England. Okay. Um, okay. I, I mentioned before about the self-made men that we would talk talk more more about that. So so. You have the emergence of the self-made man in America. This is interesting. Ben Franklin claimed an industrious man would become a rich one in America. Uh, could you not do this in England? Well, it was different. So this, just for an example, uh, tell you how America and England were different. In England, let's just say that you were born in the, in the lower working class in England. But somehow you rose to the point where you got education and you cured cancer. And this is just an example, an extreme, exaggerated example to illustrate a point. You cured cancer. So, of course, you're going to be pretty popular and famous, right, in the world. And you're probably going to make some money, right? I mean, I would think so. You're going to become wealthy. But in England, no matter what you did, even cure cancer, no matter what you did, you'd always be a person that came from the lower class and would not be seen as welcome in the upper class. It's just the way it is. In America, they celebrate people that rise to, you know, heights from humble origins. You know, they 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 celebrate that. Uh, Andrew Jackson, the I believe the seventh president, um, and we'll talk a, li a lot about him in the next couple of chapters. This is a man that was born in, in, in utter poverty, an Irish immigrant family, and he rises to become a wealthy man as well as the president. So this is a, this is a different kind of trait of America, where if you, if you start in the lower class and you get educated and cure cancer, they're going to celebrate you to, to no end. And it doesn't matter where you came from. You're the elite now. But that wouldn't happen in, in Europe. So that, that's, a, that's kind of a difference. Uh, so understand, manliness and masculinity played a big part in 19th century Victorian America. Men were brought up to achieve, be leaders, take charge. Not women. When we're, when we we're Republican motherhoods and the cults, stay home, take care of the kids. Men become leaders, take charge. Uh... So this is a result of, of the masculinity associated with being a Victorian man. And like I said, the self-made men. America celebrated men who rose to wealth or social prominence from humble origins through self-discipline and hard work. So, you know, this is another example of the Protestant work ethic. You didn't have the Protestant work ethic in Europe because they didn't have that, that movement there. They didn't have those people there. They happened here. Uh... So the Protestant work ethic is very much an American ideal, born in the days of the Puritans from, from a fear of being left behind from predestination we talked about. This is, this, this is a result of the same thing. The self-made man is a result of that hard-working person that can't stop. Uh, but opportunities come out of the era also, especially for women. So we, we talked about women you know, a lot so far. Women stay at home, take care of your kids, re raise them to be patriotic, and, and a, a, especially your, your young boys. But now, with all this increased industry and, and all these other things, you've, you've got uh, you know, a, a rise in the need for teachers. 
And teachers was not seen as a job for a man. In fact, a man would be looked down on for being a teacher. So we don't live in that world today, but sometimes we do. I, I can tell you a personal story just for fun. My own father, who's 94, um, he still can't completely you know, respect and accept that his son's a teacher. He doesn't like that. I, I should have been something, I should have been an engineer like him. You know, that's what men do. Women teach that he's so here he is still alive in this era today. He still has that kind of that kind of 19th century point of view. Um, and and I, I would say many older men, especially uh, his age, he's in his 90s. But even even in my age, in my 60s, you, you still get a lot of that kind of idea that, you know, uh, teaching's a job for women. And they kind of smirk at men that are teachers. So there's an increased need for teachers in the 1800s, and the pub a, a public school system was expanding. Uh, this, you know, gave many middle class women the opportunity to become teachers. It was a respectable way for a single woman, a single woman, to earn a living to enter the workforce. So when it, I just said single women, and you have the stereotype of the the middle aged spinster teacher, you know, a, a woman in her 40s and 50s that never got married and was just a, a spinster and a teacher, kind of a very a, a, a caricature and a stereotype that you still see see uh, fragments of here and there. Why was it single women becoming becoming teachers? Because the, the woman that was married was home taking care of her family. So it wasn't really an opportunity for a, a married woman, it was an opportunity for a single woman. Uh, so the increase of educational opportunities for women, uh, they, they, they have those opportunities. And, they, and the first institute, institutes of higher education for women were in America were teacher training colleges. Uh, women began attending colleges by the, by the 1860s. By 1880, they made up a third of all college students in the United States. Another job that was for women was nursing. So even today... If you, if you if you know a person that's a nurse and it's a woman, she's called a nurse. But if you know a man that's called a, that, that's a nurse, you call him a male nurse. We can't di really differentiate. We have to make a categorization. A man's not a nurse; he's a male nurse. A woman's a nurse. So you know, a, again, a job that was seen for women, and even 20 years ago, to become a nurse as a man, people question what your what your motives were. Now, of course, we see them everywhere, and it's completely accepted, but they're still called male nurses, not nurses. So nursing became a respectable occupation for middle-class women in the 1850s, mostly due to the reforms of Florence Nightingale that you see here in the picture. May we hope that when we are all dead and gone, leaders will arise who have been personally experienced in the hard practical work, the difficulties, and the joys of organizing nursing reforms and who will lead far beyond anything we have done. So during the Crimea, Crimean War, so you don't have to know that, but just in case you're interested, the, the, the Crimean War was in the mid-19th century. It was Britain and France versus Russia. So an interesting idea that Britain and France were on the same side for once. Uh, so Florence Nightingale and a team of nurses improved the unsanitary conditions at a British-based hospital during this war. And this reduced the death count by two thirds. So imagine just being clean and washing up and washing your hands and cleaning, uh, you know, uh, scalpels or, or you know utensils that you use in surgery just by keeping them clean saved two thirds of the, of the men. Uh, her work and writings about it sparked worldwide healthcare reform. In 1860, she established the St. Thomas Hospital and. <clears throat> And the Nightingale Training School for Nurses, another training school for women. Uh, these reforms raised the status of nursing as a profession, and many women flocked to become nurses. So teachers, nurses, what is another stereotypical job that was typically women? Secretaries. Uh, so unlike working class, I'm sorry, I, mean, I'm, I lost my spot here. So, so women were also making inroads into office work and library work by the late 1800s. So again, librarians, kind of a job that people associate with women. Uh, always single women because the married ones were home taking care of their kids. 
So as office work expanded and, and, and the typewriter prevailed, women workers became more numerous, but of course paid less because they were women. In, but in general, so this is good. This is, a, this is a movement for more independence for women. But in general, women's social roles remain the same. Middle class married women would generally expect to stay at home and manage the house, but like I've said up a million times. Unlike working class women who very often had to keep on working after they were married, they couldn't afford to not have that extra income. Uh, a married woman uh, had, had a family, as we've talked about, was expected to exercise an influence for good over her husband and children in her role as wife and mother. Uh, and the 19th century family we've talked about um, before also. So the middle class encompasses a wide variety of different kinds of people. And it, it just depends on your living conditions, your, your wages. Th th these are all variable. A successful doctor or a lawyer would likely be making more money than a clergyman or a teacher. Uh, a middle class family would, would probably, probably be, in some cases, prosperous enough, especially the upper middle class, to, to afford a maid. Uh, better off households could afford two or three servants. This this changed women's lives because now they don't have to be home every second to take care of the kids and make the meals and wash the clothes. You have a, a maid or a servant do it. This led to free time that we'll get into more about here in the next few chapters. Uh, many middle class families could afford to put their children through high school, not college, high school. Uh, children from the better off middle class families might go to college. So understand, they didn't have Board of Governors waivers then, and they didn't have community colleges and financial aid. That, you know, you you went to college if you had money. If you didn't have money, it doesn't matter how smart you were, it doesn't matter how motivated you were, you, you didn't go because you couldn't afford it. College was for wealthy people. Uh, but this wasn't the case for working class families and working class children. Uh, most working class children, many, would leave school before they even reached high school. Uh, if they got to school at all, uh, they had to go to work and help support the family from, from as, as young as they could start. Uh, this was the case regardless of color. This is not a color thing. That Poor white children grew up with lack of opportunity also. But back to our, back to our <coughs> middle class and upper middle class <coughs> white families. You have what's called the rise of gentility. And we've talked about this before, this idea of trying to have the qualities and manners of people who have high social status, or at least pretending to be, trying to impress everybody. So how do you do that? If you're an upper, upper middle class white woman, and you've got this nice big home, you're, and your husband is making a lot of money, and you have spare time because of servants, you, you might do interior decorate your house. You're going to load your bookcases with all the popular books. You can put art in the wall. You're going to have expensive furniture, domestic servants to help you. you know, all this was designed to let people know that you had arrived. We, we are wealthy, okay? Uh, this is the Victorian era in the Western world, Europe and America. But this was not uh, so also known as genteel society. And, and this is a idea that was much more prevalent in the South, as, as we'll learn about when we get there. But this was not the case for the urban poor. They had, they had no access to any of this. doesn't matter what color you are. Uh, Pre-Civil War, they had no white people here. Very poor, impoverished white people. You see there in the picture with no hope. Uh, 1846 million people labored for others. Did all the dirty work, all the labor, all the physical work, uh, the blue collar. Uh, at the beginning of the 1800s, most poor Americans, and I'm talking about in the north, so outside of the south, because the south was agricultural, not quite in the same category as the north. But by the 1800s, poor Americans in the north were resembling the poor of Europe that you, that you wanted to get away from. You wanted to get away from that lack of opportunity. Here you are in the new, new world, and the same thing's happening. Mm. Uh, so many were orphans and widows and people too old or too sick to work, seasonal workers out of season. 
So industrialization brought immigration, brought poverty. It all kind of went together. Uh, poverty of, of a new kind and on a new scale to American cities that had never been seen before. The number of people that needed help increased dramatically. Uh, in part from the sporadic nature of all the industrial jobs, where you'd have a job and you'd be, be let off. Uh, also in part uh, from the recurring financial panics that are part of the capitalist world that we live in today. We had one in 2008, a, a major recession that you could almost call a depression. They happened. You didn't have them before because you didn't have a market. You didn't have stocks and you didn't have people trading business because there wasn't any business. So understand, you know, the, the modern world is born from this, and that's what the world we live in today. Urban builders, for the first time, constructed, constructed housing exclusively for the poor. Tenements, shoddily built, poor materials, not to code, nobody cared. It was just for these low-life workers. Uh, they were extremely overcrowded, fell into immediate disrepair from a lack of upkeep from slumlords. So we've heard that term today. Slumlord is something you hear about a lot today. What is that? A person that owns an apartment building, but all they want is the rent. They don't care about the upkeep. So your heater's broken. Your windows are broken. Your locks don't work. Fix them yourself. I don't care. Pay me my rent. I mean, you can't get away with that entirely today, but many still do. So these workers live in dilapidated dwellings, bad neighborhoods, lived in these tenements. In many cases, these apartments would be cut up into two or three for, for more rent, and you'd have multi-families living in one room with the, with the partition as a wall. This is a pretty uh, uh, um, awful description of living in the tenements. Gaunt, shivering people with wild, ghastly faces living amid hideous squalor in deadly effluvia, the dim, undrained quartz oozing with pollution, the dark, narrow stairways decay with age, reeking with filth, overrun with vermin. Wow. Sign me up. Okay. The growing numbers of these urban poor were foreign born. Um, many were Eastern European immigrants, not Western Euro European immigrants, but Eastern. Uh, you, people coming with different languages and different religions that we talked about before. Uh, many of the Irish came in the 1850s, came by, came by the hundreds of thousands. Why, why did so many Irish come fleeing the potato famine in the 1850s? Um, Irish peasants in Ireland had subsisted solely on potatoes. Um, potatoes are rich in protein, carbohydrates, minerals, vitamins, especially vitamin C. So it's possible to stay healthy on a diet of potatoes alone. And they really had no other choice. They could not afford anything else. It's a, it's a cheap way to eat. But beginning in 1845 and lasting for six years, there was a potato famine. The potatoes in Ireland were struck by a disease called blight. And you have a famine. So the blight is a fungus-like organism uh, that results in potatoes growing much smaller uh, and mushy and impossible to eat. Uh, this damaged, damaged the potato crops in several countries and caused widespread hardship. So why is this important to American history? Why am I talking about Irish history here? Because all these people came to America. This is the Irish immigration chart uh, from 1825 to 1890. And here in 1840-45, you see this big spike goes up. Uh, and they all come here. Uh so the famine killed over a million men, women, and children in Ireland and caused another million to flee the country. So the result is two million less people in Ireland. A million die, a million flee. Many came to America uh, into, a, into a country that had been growing rapidly. We just were talking about the explosion of business and commerce because of the Industrial Revolution, the Transportation Revolution. America is growing rapidly. But it was mostly white Protestants. And now you've got the, the injection of, of Irish Catholics and many Eastern European people that were also Catholic or perhaps Jewish that spoke different languages. So, so they didn't mix well with the white Protestants either. So you're talking about whites versus whites here. 
And but the Irish were looked down upon as the lowest of the low, and they were called the white N words. They they used the same word but called them white. You you're a religious and ethnic slur used to refer to Irish Catholics. Uh, Protestant white people in America, the established people that, had, that were here, felt the Irish were at the bottom of the social pyramids with the African Americans. And it was all about a fear of Catholicism. Uh, so many Irish Catholic immigrants, <clears throat> this resulted in tensions between these two groups and the rise of anti-Catholic groups and the rise of what is called nativism. Native Americans, beware of foreign influence. Well, now, now wait a minute. Who's a Native American? Any any white person that's here now or then is a is an immigrant. We don't we don't want to always describe it that way, but it's true. Uh, so so nativist movement is anti-immigrant, <coughs> anti-minority. <coughs> in many cases, anti-women. Many people uh, today accuse. Donald Trump of being a nativist. You're cutting off all of our trade ties. You're you're kind of trying to make America isolationist. You want to cut people out of opportunity that don't look like you. He's accused of that. I'm not accusing him of that. I'm just simply passing on that information. Uh, but in these days, in our era, the, the, the key to the nativist movement was anti-Catholic, anti-Irish. So the Irish came and they were poor. Even when even when somebody wanted help. Not if you're Irish. Uh, so the Irish were, uh, you know, ha were at the start of a very long struggle to gain some, you know, uh, their their place in society. Which, of course, today we don't we don't look at Irish people quite this way. But back in those days, they did. So so poor people cope coped in various ways. You know, with all this poverty, all this despair, and they believe that their poverty was temporary. So poor people survive through small savings, rigid thrift, uh, you know, being frugal became much of, of the American kind of character because you had to. It wasn't because Americans are cheap. You had to save every penny because you just you, you couldn't survive without it. Uh, you, you, you relied on help from family members, odd jobs, maybe going to debt. Uh, you might have small savings. Very few did, but some some might. Aid from churches, fraternal associations, trade unions would give aid. Uh, but more and more in the late 1800s, you see this uniquely American kind of idea, tramps and hobos. Uh, these are men that would travel from city to city in the surrounding areas looking for any type of work. Uh, this, of course, grew more in the, in the later 1800s with the, with the rise of railroads. Uh, so tramp or hobo became a commonplace description for who were considered rootless men who walked the highways or illegally rode the railroads looking for opportunity and some 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 opportunity to, to make some find some work and make some money. So of course, like today, people that live lives of despair, impoverished, no hope, uh, nothing to look forward to. What do you turn to? Alcohol. Uh, you turn to alcohol as a way to cope with their miserable lives. And you have a huge number of alcoholics in the 19th century. What did this lead to? Looking at the image here, it led to domestic violence, spousal, and child abuse. But Americans are pretty proud of drinking, and we, we promote it as a, as a you know, lifestyle. And advertise it on TV or wherever on the internet, you know, it, it romanticizes drinking. People that are drinking beer on the beach and running around in the sun with surfboards and jet skis are having fun. You should go out and buy some of this and have fun too. When you go buy the six pack or whatever it is, 12 pack, 18 pack, 24 pack, whatever, somehow the beach and the sun and the pretty girls don't come with it. It's just you and a, and a bottle of beer. But, but they push it as a lifestyle. Let's watch our next film. Uh, please watch the film Drink Part 1, A History of Drinking in America. And then come on back. Okay, so alcohol is ingrained into American society in all of the eras. Part of the legend of America, the hard-fisted, two-fisted American drinking man at the saloon, John Wayne. But truly, it caused many more problems than it solved. And it led to a rise of the temperance movement. Uh, temperance means to avoid drinking. Uh, 
Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Uh, so temperance drinking was seen as the most serious problem. People drank on the job. We saw in the film on the Erie Canal, they, they get their alcohol. I mentioned this before, the National Roads, taverns every mile. Drinking was a huge part of daily life, for, especially for men. In some cases, it was encouraged at work. Uh, alcohol was part of a soldier's rations, even in the Civil War. A soldier was given a ration of rum every day. Imagine if you were in the army today and they gave you a pint of rum every day. Go ahead and drink whatever you want. It's hard to imagine. So the, the American Temperance Society was founded in 1832, inspired by the evangelical teachings and revivals that set out to eliminate or at least diminish the consumption of alcohol. The purpose of the organization uh, was to promote temperance while letting drunkards die off and rid the world of an amazing evil. Wow. So alcoholism is a huge problem in 19th century America. Uh, very difficult to control or stop. Became a popular movement to ease the burdens of society. And a stereotype and a caricature is born of the, of the spinster, prudish, uptight, middle-class white woman uh, who doesn't know how to have fun and you know, high-collared, uh, you know, uh, on the shirts and long dresses, not showing any skin, and this 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 person that wants to take away everybody's fun, and, and that's you know a small part of that might be what this was, but ninety eight percent of it was not that. Ninety eight percent of it was these women were tired of getting beat up by their husbands. It was part of their lives, and I can tell you personal experience. Both of my grandfathers worked in the steel mills and the coal mines in Pittsburgh in their lives. And they'd work hard from very early morning to whatever they got off. And they wouldn't come home. They'd go to a bar every night and drink to excess and then come home and beat their wives and kids, my grandmother and my mother and my uncles. That was, that was their lives. You know, it's not that, it's not that long ago. It's part of my life that, you know, this happened to. So, we're not talking about ancient history here, just 100 years ago or even, even what am I saying, more like uh, 70, 80 years ago, this was happening. So it came from a real place. It, it didn't come from a prudish place, and I don't want anybody to have fun. It wasn't about that at all. It was real. Uh, so the plight of the urban poor was not a good one. Un unlike the rising middle class, the urban poor never had disposable income. They could never have servants. They had little chance of rising above and buying a better house in a better neighborhood. Uh, they did not make en enough money to, to survive as it was. They had very little chance of getting out of their poverty. So you turn to alcohol. Uh, you have the rise of what was called the benevolent empire. So what is that? A, a broad-ranging campaign of moral and institutional reforms inspired by evangelical Christian ideals endorsed by upper middle class men and women in the 1820s and 30s, designed to, to reform these problems that the, that the Industrial Revolution has thrust upon us. So I'm not trying to suggest the Industrial Revolution was a negative thing. You, you, could, you, you couldn't make that argument change the world and resulted in goods being available to everybody because of the reduction in price. But there's always a there's always an underside of everything, the yin and the yang. And in this case, the it also led to a lot of despair, and in this case, alcoholism. Uh, so the Benevolent Empire were organizations of conservative social reform designed to restore the moral government of God. They felt that, that people are losing their faith and their spirituality. It's a result of the Great Awakenings, the first and second that we talked about. Um in their minds, their, their belief was alcohol led to poverty. It was hard to argue against that. So they battled drunkenness, but, but also adultery and prostitution and crime. Uh, women were a large part of these organizations, and they set up charitable institutions. Um, the members of the Benevolent Empire felt the decline in religious observance was the responsible for the moral decay. Uh, businesses were now open on Sundays. It was a result of the market revolution. We're making too much money. So don't, don't worry about faith and church. Let's, let's work and make, 
make money on Sunday too because there's money to be made. Capitalism takes over at the expense of worship. <clears throat> uh, so the problems of the lower rungs of society led to revivalism and reform in this era. And you have what's called the idea of what's called the moral free agent, an idea of Charles Grandison Finney. Who was he? Uh, he was the, an, an evangelical preacher of that time. Uh, the doctrine of free will was his central message. Uh, and this became attractive to the newer members of the middle class, not the working class, the middle class. In their minds, we, we've accepted responsibility for our lives. We've improved our material condition. We've made it. And they welcomed the idea of an assurance that heaven was also within their grasp. Okay, that is the end of chapter 9. Thank you.